Hey everybody, it's David Duford here. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. It is time again for yet another live, no BS, Q&A session live with you guys right here on the YouTubes. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. And just to let you guys know, if you are watching this and you'd rather listen to an audio uh, live version of this, uh, you'll see some login credentials uh, for the conference call line, and then you can hop in and listen to everything that's on YouTube uh, on the conference call line. So uh, that's something I've been doing the past couple of months. This is a great training if this is your first one. And let me kind of give you an overview of what to expect today. So uh, this whole entire training is about you. It's about answering your questions as it relates to anything uh, selling or marketing insurance. Uh, I open up the lines literally on the conference call line. If you'd like to dial in, uh, go ahead and uh, ask a question, or you can just post a question in the chat, and I'll be happy uh, to answer. Uh, I see Gordon's on. How you, how you doing, Robert? And thanks, guys, so much for joining. So uh, this is pretty much open-ended. Uh, no question is dumb. Uh, you'll find that many of the questions that people have are all of the same uh, kind of questions. So I always encourage everybody to feel free to ask away. So a couple of things here. If you're on the conference call line, of course, you have the unique opportunity of speaking to me live. Uh, if you have a question at any point in this broadcast, simply press five star. That will allow you to raise your hand. I'll be able to visually see it on the screen here. And then once I start taking questions, I'll just work my way down the list and uh, have you pop in and ask away. So again, five star raises your hand if you're on the live conference call. Again, if you are in the chat, uh, you are welcome to uh, join us on the call if you'd like. Uh, you'll see the login credentials in the uh, posted in the uh, description below. It's uh, the number is 712-770-8055 and login ID is 132422. Hey everybody, uh, glad uh, y'all are coming in. So I'm going to start today kind of with a uh, a little bit of an update and uh, kind of some perspective for you, a little different than what I normally do. So you may have noticed, uh, I'm sure all of you follow me uh, intensely, hanging on every uh, breath and word that I speak. I didn't do a live stream last month. You may be wondering, Dave, where'd you go? How could I ever make it in this business without you live streaming? So I compiled a little bit of a, uh, a story, I guess you could say, and uh, wanted to show you where I've been and what I did. So, uh, first of all, I went on vacation all month in July. It wasn't an entire vacation, but it was kind of like a working vacation. And I had the pleasure to return to a, uh, a childhood vacation spot. My family's originally from uh, southeast Michigan, mostly Detroit. And my grandfather, who's long gone, he's deceased, used to own a cottage in Huron, uh, off of Lake Huron in Canada. So, if this is Michigan... Yeah, is that the right way? I think so. this is the right way. Ontario is kind of right here. This is Lake Huron. And we're kind of like right here. And so um, I've been wanting to go back for a long time. Kind of missed it, nostalgia and all that. And I'm at the point in my life where not I could do this for a really long time. And the nice thing about what I do, I can do everything over the phone, talk to agents, help them out. Uh, so it wasn't a big deal. So I wanted to show you, again, kind of some pictures uh, just to share the memories with you guys and then kind of wrap it up with the last picture. I think we'll bring a lot of this full course so you can kind of see why I'm doing this to begin with. So let me go ahead and pull up the pictures here. You just have to bear with me here. And uh, there, you should be able to see it. So this is the uh, sunset here on Lake Huron. Uh, the water's up pretty high this year. There's not much of a beach. There's a little bit of a beach, but it's super beautiful. It was like 70s all year long, uh, 70s uh, degrees all month long. I mean, we we're literally wearing um, uh, sweaters some days, but I'll take it over this 90 degree, 100% humidity. I know some of you guys know what I mean. This is my little girl. Uh, you can see me in the background. Uh, this is her first time swimming. Got some sand on the butt, uh, enjoying uh, the swimming. That's my son, David. He's 10 years old. He turned 10 on this trip. Uh, man, it's amazing how fast I grew up. It's crazy. Uh, and then here's my wife and I uh, getting drunk outside. <laughs> uh, I like champagne. And then here's my little girl, Elle, again, uh, being pushed on a stroller ride. I got to take her on little stroller rides every day, kind of down the street. 
uh, spend some time with my daughter. Here's my two other girls. You guys know I have twins. Uh, this is uh, Eva and Emily. They turned six this month. And they had fun swimming literally in the water when it was like 60 degrees outside. They're crazy. The lake is like in the 50s, I swear. And then this is us eating uh, definitely not keto uh, uh, ice cream. Uh, we did that a couple of times. It's pretty good. And then the last thing here uh, is not necessarily related uh, at all, but it is, I guess, in a way uh, to why I'm showing you this picture. So $98.62. Maybe asking, what does that mean? What's the significance of that number? Is that what I paid for the trip? Definitely not. <laughs> so why am I so showing you 98.62 on the screen? Well, $98.62 is approximately the value of the money or the, my bank account in May 2012, at the lowest point of my final expense career. I had been selling final expense since April or May 2011. I'd had a good run, uh, some off months, but overall pretty well. And uh, at the first and kind of beginning of the second quarter, got off track. I stopped doing what was effective, namely direct mail pieces that we still use today. And I started inventing and crafting these new lead pieces. And I thought I could beat the system as it was designed. And um, I remember the moment where, A, I quit the business dealing with uh, an agent killer. And then I also remember the moment when I pulled up my bank account because I was avoiding, you know, I had avoidance behavior when it came to managing my money. And I saw that I had $98.62 or whatever the number was. It was definitely below $100 in the 90s. And I thought, well, hell, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got uh, a rent payment due. I've got a wife who's uh, frankly sick of this uh, up and down roller coaster. I've got a son. David at the time was probably, gosh, four, three, something like that. And I remember the feeling of emotionally quitting this business and thinking, I'm going to have to go work for somebody else, of which I did. If you guys know my story, uh, you kind of know how it worked. Uh, I went to work for someone else, eventually got back in the final expense. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is, I, look, I'm not the, if you guys watch enough of my videos, you know that none of my videos, and this is intentional, I don't like to share, like, the cars, the lifestyle. I think that's, I think a lot of that's bullshit, first of all. And then second of all, I think that it's, it's not what really matters. What matters is how can we improve ourselves to become better. Money's not everything. It's a big part of this business for sure. But it's not everything. I think learning how to do this business successfully and having the tools to do it is what really matters. That's why so much of my videos focus on what they do. But I'm showing you this today because I still feel that way about um, the kind of content that's put out there. But more importantly, I just want to let you guys know that you can, if you're out there and you're struggling, you can come back from rock bottom, okay? For whatever reason, we're given a path in life that will go down in a series of circumstances. And how we deal with it will be the determination of where we go. And of course, this is easy to look back and say all this. Uh, I can remember personally being in the middle of it, you know, just, just being defeated, you know. But deep down, I knew I could do better. And I wasn't going to let me quit completely out of com quit completely out of trying to improve my life. So I wanted to contrast the pictures of what I would consider to be an, an awesome opportunity to take my kids and my wife on a much deserved vacation uh, to a nice place, uh, relaxing, fun, uh, to where I was literally seven years ago. You can turn yourself around. So if you guys are out there struggling. Please take my story to heart. Um, it's something that if you decide that you will overcome it, you will. It may not happen uh, instantly. You may have more doubts and frustration. But you have to take control. And many times you'll look back, as I do now. I'm glad I bottomed out. I'm glad I had to go work for the man. It was a much-needed life lesson for me. And uh, I'm thankful for it because it's made me a better person, it's made me a better uh, producer, recruiter. Everything in my life is enhanced by my failures, so I can't 
not uh, be appreciative on for it for some level. So, anyways, I wanted to just start off with a little bit of uh, I don't know uh, a motivational post, I guess you could say. Um, I don't do much of that, but hopefully you guys can see where I'm coming from and uh, take it for what it's worth. All right, enough for that. Let's get to some questions. All right, so I'm going to start in the chat here. This is your time to raise your hand and ask questions. Again, a lot of you guys are popping in on the conference call. I'm glad to hear you. Uh, if you just popped in, five star raises your hand. I can see it on my screen, and I'm happy to take your call live on air. Um, if you don't, you'll just continue listening. I won't call on you. Uh, you'll just hear me uh, answer questions as I go through it. So I'm going to start with the chat because that's where usually most of these questions come from. So let's good. Uh, Pocket Man. Actually, this is actually the perfect, I think, way to get started. I know nothing about insurance. I hate my job and looking for a career change. Why should I sell life insurance? Hopefully my opening salvo there gives you some kind of reason why uh, it's worth considering. Life insurance, the reason I got into life insurance is the money. Um, a lot of people will cringe at that, but let's face it, money is what gets us into this business. If we wanted to do charity, we would be in charity. So the first of all, the opportunity to make money in this business with the right setup, of course, is limitless. Um, you have so much opportunity to make as much or as little money as you want. And a nice thing that's coupled with that is you also have the ability to work as much or as little as you'd like because you're essentially a business owner, okay? On top of that, you're faced with literally an unyielding large amount of prospects that you can go see and talk to. There are so many Americans right now that need life insurance but don't know where to turn. They see ads on TV, they get junk mail, they see internet ads, and they just don't know what to do. And many, a, a large amount of them, and despite the uh, stig stigma against salespeople, want an insurance agent to guide them to make the right decision. So life insurance just offers, in my opinion, somebody with, doesn't matter what their background is, the opportunity to make a good living, to, to control and have freedom of their schedule, and to live this kind of life where you have the ability to not only make good money, but have the time to enjoy it too. Now, does this happen overnight? Absolutely not. Uh, I liken this process to a three to five year type of process. Um, you will struggle. Many people struggle like myself. But the payoff is incredible. For the people who can stick with this business, it typically turns out to be wonderful. Um, plus, the products you sell really change. Um, and that's enough about the money but and the life that you get from it. But the product you sell through life insurance is incredible. Look, when somebody dies and you've written a policy, you really don't know what this business is like until you see Mrs. Jones, your client, who, who passes away or their spouse passes away. And you see the company come in because of your work, your good work, uh, taking a beating, dealing with rejection, and finally finding somebody who's open-minded and buys from you. And when that person passes away, you get to see the good work that insurance provides where literally no money was there, and now $100,000 million is there to protect the family and their legacy because of an untimely sad death. That's something that a lot of products can't do, whether you sell cars, no, and of course, no criticism here. But there is a lasting impact that life insurance can provide uh, that other products don't provide. They're just material possessions, whereas life insurance secures the existence of a family. And uh, this can't be overstated. So you have the, the money-making opportunity, the ability to control your lifestyle much more, and the satisfaction knowing you're do doing good work. And the nice thing is within life insurance, you've got different subsections. You've got, or submarkets. you've got final expense. You can sell term insurance mortgage protection, when somebody buys a home, sell life insurance to cover the mortgage. There's all sorts of different ways to get involved. And of course, I'll just direct you to my website, daviddufour.com. If, if you click the Join Dave's Agency link at the top, you'll get some ideas of different products you can sell. That would probably be a good idea at this point to check out, especially if you're just at the beginning stages of this, just to figure out if this is right for you or not. All right, Chris says, hey, Chris Kent, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining. Um, by the way, guys, you ask these questions. If you want to follow up with another question, feel free to. 
Hey, David, do you always try calling before door knocking? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, it really is your decision and what procession you want to go. I can tell you a lot of agents who do call prefer to call to set the appointment first and then use their time in between those booked appointments to door knock the leads. But it doesn't really matter. Um, door knocking works just as well, or if not better, than calling to set the appointment. In fact, a lot of organizations just teach you to go out and door knock. They don't want you to on the phone because there's a perception that using the phone, and there's some truth to it, uh, is a different skill set. And you might burn leads that you otherwise wouldn't if you just showed up, shook hands, and made eye contact, and you know, got in the door right on the spot. So I think whatever works best for you is uh, ultimately what you should do. But if you're on the phone and you're trying to improve your phone work, please make sure that, uh, yeah, go ahead and just call them first. Uh, don't, don't try to like knock them first or vice versa. Just, just call when you get your leads in, start setting appointments, go see the people and uh, stay with it. Hey, Chris Smith, what's going on, man? Dave, I'm sitting outside a house in the hood. Stood up for my last appointment. Good to catch you live. Absolutely, man. I saw your video. Well, I didn't see your video, but I saw you posted one up. If you guys, uh, Chris is um, a, one of the, well, you used to be. I think you stopped or something like that. But Chris was a part of a, called the Insurance Panel. It's another YouTube channel. Um, lots of, there's a couple of guys in there, very well experienced agents. Um, it's a non recruitment focused orientation. You guys should check it out. Chris does or used to, I don't know the details there, uh, provide a lot of training. Uh, check it out if you haven't already. Uh, just put insurance panel into the uh, YouTube search and you'll find it. Hey, George, what's up? Let me check here. Okay, everybody's still listening. Very good. Hey, Chris, what's going on? Hey, Gary, what's going on? Okay, Beggles, what's up, man? Beggles asks a great question. My first week, is it possible to be honest in selling? Absolutely. Um, the funny thing is about selling, no matter if it's, uh, you know, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or boiler room stuff, you have to understand you're brainwashed <laughs> in a sense. So what I mean by that is Hollywood portrays salespeople as full of shit. Let's just say it as it is. And there's some that are. But the thing is, is that you have the ability to sell in such a way that doesn't have to be, okay? This is a big point of contention for me. When I first started, I didn't like the assumptive nature of how most final expense sales was sold. Uh, what I mean by assumptive nature is, you know, just very much uh, is this is the best policy you've ever seen, right? This is something you couldn't imagine living without, right? To me, and, and it's, it's psychologically it works, but to me it's very manipulative. I felt dirty, like I had to take a shower after saying that stuff. So I went the route of what's called consultative selling. Highly would recommend looking at any type of salesmanship that focuses on consultative approach. So some good recommendations. My whole channel is based off of consult. My whole training approach is consultative. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not, there's a few times and I'll use assumptive psycho or assumptive verbiage, but very often what I do 99% of the time is, is very permission-based, um, designed to educate to ask open-ended questions, to learn about the client in such a way that I'm not leading them in a direction that's biased towards me without considering what matters to them first. Not everybody agrees with how I sell. That's fine. We have to all figure out what works. But if you are doing a sales process and it doesn't feel right, you need to trust your instincts and understand there's a different way. So if you're selling insurance, you may want to follow up with what kind of insurance you're selling. But find... Like with me, if you're selling final expense, just do what I do. That's huge. Um, find books that teach consultative sa selling. I think Sa the Sandler method is one of those. Uh, uh, Claude Whitaker uh, has a couple of books. He's a sales trainer, not well known, but really good. Uh, actually, he's excellent. So I would recommend picking up his sales training stuff. And and ask yourself what you're. And if you can feel free to reply back, what are you doing if you've done this yet? that feels dishonest. And I can tell you how to better address it in a way. I mean, like I'll take it, for example, if I have somebody who is on, a, you know, they have congestive heart failure, dialysis, they're five foot, 500 pounds, they take a hundred units of insulin and they have diabetic neuropathy and they're bipolar. Um, they're going to be somebody 
that cannot qualify for first day coverage, okay, with, with final expense. Where they will qualify for is what we call guaranteed acceptance insurance. So there's no questions asked, but there's a two-year waiting period brought up. Now, how do you address that to the client? Do you not tell them? Do you just kind of like not mention it? Because some, some salespeople say saying less is selling more or something like that. Less is more. Or do you just tell them flat out what it is? Well, I've always practiced telling them like it is. And the way I do it, for example, is to say, look, here's the good news. The good news is I can qualify for a program. It doesn't matter about your health. Your rates will never go up. Your coverage ever cancels. But here's the fine print. I'm just going to be totally upfront with you. I cannot cover you, nor can anybody else, for, cover you for natural death for the first two years. I would love to get you covered fully from the first year, but there's no way with your collection of health issues. And, but here's the thing. If you buy this today, Sure, you're not covered. We'll pay the money back if you die plus 10% interest uh, within the two years. But the thing is, is you have to look at this as a long-term program. It's not the first two years that are most important. It's what happens after the first two years. And after you have the two years, you're fully covered. Nobody can ever take it away. And I promise you, you'll be so thankful that you took the plunge, bought the policy, and got through that two years. Because if you wait, if you don't take action today, you're going to have to do the two years at some point anyhow. So bottom line, there's two types of people that uh, go along with this. The first time, first type of person absolutely does not believe in guarantee. They don't want this kind of coverage. They think it's, they want coverage that only covers them, even though they know there's no other options. That's fine with me if that's what you want. The second option is they understand the circumstances and they get it. Where do you fit, Mr. Prospect? So I like saying that for that example, because my delivery there is 100% honest. I say it exactly the same way that I just did. I tell them, look, there's fine print. You're not covered. But I explain to them why that is good. And that's the selling part. But that's an honest delivery of how you actually sell this. So um, I hope that provides some perspective. I just think that it's really important to have that perspective of uh, how to address your process and sales presentation. And the last thing I'll say is your clients really, really appreciate it. They all expect us to be full of crap. Uh, amaze them by being straight with them. Uh, they will like you, and uh, they will refer you, and they will keep business with you. Ah, okay. Yeah, Traverse City, Michigan. Okay, yeah, that's way on up there. Up there in the Youpers. Hey, James, what's going on? James says, you're an asset to the business. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, just getting through these comments here. Uh, Luzelina, hope you said your name right. Hi, Dave. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got twins too. Cool, Chris. I hope you survived all right. We're getting through it all right. Oh, fraternal twins. Cool. All right, couple here. Great. D squared. That's right. Okay, so Robert's got a good question. This kind of relates to what I was saying. How to write a script that's less scripted. Okay, so here's my recommendation. You don't want to, hopefully, the, there may be the question of should you be scripted in your sales presentation or your appointment setting, your door knocking. I would argue, yes, you should be, to an extent, okay? Here's the thing. This, it, what's imbued in the script is a collection of experiences from other agents, trainers, and the outcome of all that collective experience is the what it is the culmination of what's on that paper. Sure, it's going to have the personal communication biases that somebody else has that you may not have. But what you have to understand is that a script, essentially, oh, hold on one second, guys. Sorry about that. I'm going to mute this real quick. All right. Let me see if I can turn this off here. All right, all right, that should do it. So what you have to understand is that the script is essentially a culmination of the experience of other salespeople. And the script is something that actually works and has been proven to work. So if you go about trying to change a script, what eventually happens is, is that, um, hold on one second. Okay, there it goes, great. Okay, come on now. All right. I don't know if you guys can hear this on my end. It's a phone call coming through on my conference call. Sorry about that, guys. It, they won't hang up. <laughs> okay. I might have to hang up the conference call. 
Sorry for the, the, this is totally live. Okay. I hope it stops here. Can you guys hear that on, on, on the YouTube? Uh, okay. Tell you what, I'll just keep going here. So, okay, you can't hear it. Okay, I'll just deal with it. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this off here so it doesn't drive me nuts. <laughs> okay, so there we go. That That's perfect. Okay, so back to the script. Let me get to the point. Don't change the script. My recommendation is learn it, make it your own, follow it for the first 50 to 100 sales presentations, and please make sure that if you start to mess with anything it's only after you've proven that what you you you've gotten success out of it so that's the thing you, you got to understand there's so much that's not explained that i have learned just being around long enough that is never really properly explained like for example the script is the perfect example like everybody thinks oh this script sounds cheesy i'm going to change it well look you're changing something that's like fundamental okay if you're getting it from somebody who knows what they're doing so instead of trying to change what works, just follow it. Adjust yourself, get used to it. And then as time progresses, you can start to change some of the verbiage in it. That's kind of what I did. Um, I changed the script that I learned uh, slightly uh, to better with my mannerisms and my word choices because there may be some words in the script you might choose, but you could substitute for something else. But just follow the script really is what it comes down to. Trust in the process. Um, but, you know, the thing that go th th this kind of goes back to the last point. I'm a big believer in consultative selling, but if you've got a high pressure, assumptive type of script and that's not you, you may want to look at another approach or another way to sell. Hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, Tax Pro says, David, if I join your team, do you recommend supplementing direct mail with age direct mail leads? And if so, do you have the resources to point your downline to? Um, thanks for the question. Not really. I don't do any age direct mail leads. Most agents go all in on fresh direct mail leads that I recruit and train and coach. And then if they want to supplement, they either do Facebook final expense leads or they do some sort of seminar marketing. Um, and then, yes, I can show you vendors that I work with. Um, I have a complete training package to teach the seminar strategy as well. So hopefully that answers your question. If you want to reply back uh, with better help, if I need to clarify anything, feel free to. <clears throat> hey, Gerardo, what's up? I'm thinking more about texting my DM leads with an image of the lead and professional headshot I have before even calling them. Your thoughts? Maybe bring their wall down. Good question. There must be something in the air because I've gotten this question probably, oh, I don't know, three or four times over the past day and in this weekend too. So here's my belief on it. Should you be texting? Yes, I think you should. I don't think you should over text. I think you should try to just text one time. Just because text messages are one of those things we all know get read, but can easily be abused if you push the envelope. And you don't want to burn a lead because of texting somebody a half dozen times. I, for the time being, the way I teach agents to do this is to call first, try to get them on the phone, try to talk to them. And if you don't, after a couple of calls, get them on the phone, then send a text message. The script they use in the text message is the same that you use over the phone. Hi, my name is David Duford. The reason I'm texting you is because you sent this card, see the picture below, requesting information on our state-regulated final expense programs, and it's my job to deliver the information to you and wondered if you're free tomorrow at 10 or would two be better. So it's to say the same thing you would on a phone script and then um, send a professional mugshot too if you'd like to. I've debated doing that. I don't know if that's like creepy or not. Like if you send pictures to a female, if they're going to be like wigged out because, <laughs> you know, or a male or who knows, you know, just getting a picture from some stranger seems kind of strange to me. But I think sending the picture of the card is great or of the lead or something to refresh their memory. And the guy I told to do this on Friday did it. And he had two out of 10 of the leads he texted, texted back and booked the appointment. I'll take that all day long if those 10 were people who never picked up the phone. Does that make sense? Now, whether to do that in the beginning or not, um, the only reason I say, and again, this is all anecdotal. Uh, I don't have any firsthand experience of this. You got to test it really to find out. But for me personally, I think I would rather want the opportunity to talk to somebody 
um, on the phone as opposed to um, as opposed to trusting a text message. Does that make sense? So I like that better. Um, I just think I'll have more control of the conversation. A text message is, gives up control, right? They have all the time in the world to think about how they're going to respond or they don't have to respond. So a phone call, you've got a little bit more persuasion tactics at your disposal. Okay. Damn, Gerardo, that sounds good, bro, at least to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Hey, 5280 Insurance Brokers, what's going on? Final expense versus mortgage protection. What say you, Mr. DuFord? Uh, I think that ultimately what you're going to find here is that, well, let me put it this way. Mortgage protection. Uh, higher commission opportunity. Uh, opportunity to cross-sell. Uh, I think the lead's slightly better. Of course, what you do with the lead is what it ultimately comes down to. Final expense, um, a slightly bit lower commission, a hell of a lot more opportunity for leads. There's way more people over 50 than there are people buying homes. And it's daytime work and final expense, nights too. You're going to get a bit of both. But with, fine, with mortgage protection, it's almost exclusively afternoon and evening work. And the questions you got to ask yourself, especially out of family, is how much can you afford to be away from your family before it starts causing problems? So even though you may make less of final expense, there's a heck of a lot more prospects and you can somewhat have a little bit more control over your schedule. So for me personally, I'm a final expense guy. Now here's the thing about mortgage protection. And I, I saw this when I first got into the business. Is anybody around 10 years ago? Does anybody ever remember when you could get a 105% uh, mortgage, like the banks would actually pay you money and all you had to do is claim that you made a million dollars and you can move into any home you want. And the banks would give you whatever you want. So I remember those days when I had my personal training gym and I remember how the housing market crashed, how the economy fell apart. And I also remember how mortgage protection took, uh, took it square in the jaw. Uh, the mortgage protection business is highly based off of economic, positive economic conditions. There was a mass exodus from mortgage protection into final expense uh, from 2009, 2010 uh, onwards. And that's where I think really final expense started picking up popularity and steam. I remember talking to one guy who used to say in Michigan back in 2005 and six, they would get like 30,000 a month of uh, 30,000 new homes closed a month. So in mortgage protection terms, that's 30,000 direct mail leads. But at the present time I talked to them, which has been probably 2015, they might get 10,000. That's a substantially less amount, probably less than that in Michigan. Substantially less opportunity. And when your whole entire marketing system is based around the lead, as is with mortgage protection, and it's directly correlated with the economy, you're running into problems. So it's not that you shouldn't do this or shouldn't consider it. It's just that be ready to pivot because who knows what the economy is going to do. But I can guarantee you if the housing market cools off or crashes, it's what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot more agents on the same prospects and there's going to be a lot more competition. And you're going to find it's going to become more difficult. Whereas with final expense, I got started in final expense at really the bottom of the housing market, the bottom of the stock market. And you look at Lincoln Heritage, you know, they'll show you stats where they grew year over year, 10, 15, 20% right through the Great Recession. And that's with a very high price product where a sales system that sells one product. So like literally imagine if it was a large agency or something or a brokerage house. Um, they do great as far as their recruitment and, and volume goes. Of course, I'm not a captive oriented person. I think you should sell multiple carriers. That's another discussion. Happy to have it. But the point is, is even with what I would consider an inferior product, they were able to grow year over year substantially. And it's largely because our final expense prospects are on a fixed income. They have much less sway to what happens economically. The government's going to pay out their Social Security and disability checks no matter what. And if they don't, I'm going to be running to the woods uh, with my, all my guns and my uh, uh, dried food and I'm going to live in a bunker, and I'll see you guys somewhere else.
So <laughs> that's the difference, I guess, in a nutshell. Uh, all right. Gary, thank you very much. Hey, Joe, what's up, man? Uh, using Dave's techniques, I had a client tell me the other day, I have never had anyone explain all this to me. Yeah, that's like when you start hearing that in, in a sales call because you're educating your client, you're going to get really good results. And again, that's what I teach my agents. You guys that are new to my channel, start reading or start watching my videos. You'll see exactly like I'm all about persuasion and creating inner tension to buy. But I don't, I'm not big on external tension and guilting people in the buy because I want people to be believers in what we're selling and believers in me personally because that's what keeps the policy. Because I can guarantee you, if you haven't started in this business and you do, some Joe Average agent is going to come behind you in three to six months. And so you have to sell in a way that anticipates your competition is coming behind you. And how are you going to prevent them from replacing you? Because they're going to try if they've got any sort of uh, skill set. It's all about trying to get rid of the incumbent policy, for most agents at least. <clears throat> D. Good, what's up, D. Good? D. Good says, hey, Dave, new agent. My close rate so far is 75%, but I'm really having problems getting people to answer the phone and lots of no-shows. Okay, I work Facebook leads. All right, do you knock Facebook the same way you do DM? Uh, absolutely, great question. So, um, Dave, new agent, close rate. So, so okay, so D, here's my question if you want to follow up. Um, when you say 75% close rate, is that your presentations? So if you give 10 presentations, you're going to close seven or eight of them? Or what are you, are you saying that if you get 10 leads, you'll, you'll write uh, seven to eight policies? Just help me clarify there. The latter description there is conversion. What is your conversion rate from leads to pol policies and leads? Your presentation close rate is for all the people you sit down with, how many closes? I'm just going to assume that's what it is. So you sit with 10 people. It may take you 30 leads to sit with 10, but you close seven or eight. Um, the problem you're having is getting people to f answer the phone. Uh-oh, you can't hear? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hey, can you guys hear me? I don't know what's going on here. Can you hear me? Let's see here. Okay. Okay, good. You guys got me scared there. Okay, good. All right. I think everybody can hear. Woo. All right. Getting back used to this live stream stuff. <clears throat> okay. So, D good, man. If you can reply back. So, so a couple things about Facebook leads, I'll tell you. Number one, they don't pick up the phone as often. That's just the way it is. I don't know why, but I think it has to do with the fact if, if a senior citizen is on Facebook uh, goofing off, they're a little bit more sophisticated than their direct mail counterparts. So they tend, and they're on their smartphone. So a lot of these smartphones, well, that's kind of a robocall prevention app. I can talk about that if you want to, but I just think it's a sophistication level. They just don't pick up the phone, which is why I think it's important that you make sure that you're also texting these people like we talked about earlier because you'll get some response from that if you just let them know you send them information about the lead and as far as door knocking you have got to go door knock them okay uh treat uh, facebook leads just like you would direct mail go see them face to face don't wait for them to pick up the phone uh joey and i uh, we actually went out and door knocked uh this was a couple months ago in march some facebook leads and we door knocked and made a sale off of a door knock and uh, I don't know, Joey probably tried calling him uh, to some success, uh, and, and we had set some for sure. But we definitely got in front of people who otherwise we didn't get on the phone. And so it can't be stressed that you got to go see these people. Now, you're getting a lot of no-shows. What does that mean? Is it three out of four show up and one out of four no-show? I can live with that. Um, but ultimately, what it's going to come down to, Diga, these are metrics that matter. But what matters most to me is like how much money you put in the bank account versus how much you're spending. If for every $100 in leads you buy, you make 400 in commission, that's great. No matter what anybody says. I don't care what your ratios are. Sure, let's work on some things and improve them. But if you're investing $1,000 in leads and you're getting back $4,000 in commission and your net on that is $3,000 every week, that, who cares? I mean, look, I care. But I'm saying that ain't that bad either. I mean, that's a great income. So just try to keep that in perspective. You know, I don't care so much about these numbers as long as the ROI is being hit. That's what matters more than anything else. 
course, we want to start working on some of these functions because it's just going to help scale exponentially our results. Uh, Sina, hey, how you doing? I'm an agent from Iran. Your advice uh, are perfect, and it works in Iran. How about that? Well, the Persians are smart people. Of course it works out there. I was going to show you something else here. Uh, you may know, if you haven't, I would absolutely recommend this book here, my Persian friend. Uh, this is uh, Mehdi. Do you know this guy? Uh, I cannot pronounce his last name. He just goes by Mehdi. That's why. Uh, if, have, do you know his story? His story is great. Nothing is impossible and then everything is possible. Those are his two books. He's a guy that works for MetLife, I think. Um, and he came here to the States in the 50s. Uh, absolutely poor, on his own. Father didn't agree with his uh, path in life. Uh, it just just went one thing after another, and he went and got a job at MetLife. And he's literally in his late 90s. He's still alive, okay? Late 90s. This guy writes a ton of business still. He just won't quit. <laughs> so it's a really good story. I think you should look into it uh, if you haven't already. He would be a great inspiration. Um, and he, does, he got a lot of uh, YouTube videos too you should check out from his old talks in the 70s and 80s. Very good. Okay. Hey, Kat, what's going on? All right. Good. Let me get to these questions here. Okay. Make sure I didn't skip anybody. Okay, James says, truth, door knock within a week. Yeah, absolutely. What does your text say? So just, I like texting. Um, I like texting better. I like texting what you would say on the phone. Just keep it simple. You know, treat it as an approach to set an appointment. Hi, my name is David Duford. The reason I'm texting you is because you sent this card back or you filled out this Facebook form requesting information about life insurance coverage. My job is to deliver the information to you. It takes five minutes for me to show you how this works. Would tomorrow at 10 or 2 work? Write that up. Send an, a visual image of the lead. Um, you may want to include the favorite hobby or favorite color or even the email, just as kind of a refresher that you're not just some scammer popping out of nowhere. <clears throat> so that will help you if you do that. Okay. Now, Filipino versus uh, telemarketed lead versus Facebook leads. Good question. That's a question. Um, I do not recommend telemarketed leads anymore. I just don't do it. Um, get perfect story. I had an agent who bought leads from a vendor who's not very popular but have been around for a long time. This happened back within the last six months. The lead was generated in supposedly in North Carolina but it was generated in South Carolina. She called the guy up, started talking, and it was telemarketed. The way it was sold to her was that these are live callers, not press one, robocall dials, blah, blah, blah. She called the lead. Start, he started asking questions. He wanted to know who he worked for. Can you send me some information? Can you send me a quote? Kind of weird back and forth stuff. Then it went away. And then they talked again. He said, you know, you called me. This whole thing's a scam, and I think we need to settle and arrange something. And she was all like freaked out, hung up on him. Well, he called Baltimore Life, okay? And, uh, oop, I was mentioning the company. He called the company. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But he called the company, went to the sales department and said, hey, look, you are in a position where your agent violated the telemarketing laws. And uh, I'm going to sue the agent, the upline, the IMO, and the insurance company. And lo and behold... Uh, here I am getting a uh, legal decree that this guy is, uh, has all these different reasons that, that this caller was from Pakistan, used a fake, you know, hi, my name is Jim. It's not really his name, something else. Um, and all the, he just went down the list here to my upline and said, this is why I'm, I, you know, you guys need to figure out a number that we can settle. So we ended up splitting a settlement with this guy for a couple thousand dollars, all right, just to make it go away. I had nothing to do with this thing, all right? Nothing. And this dude went and said, I did. But instead of trying to fight this thing, which some of you might be thinking, why did you fight? Well, it just takes time. It's money. It's in a different state. I don't want to fool with it. I just want to make the problem go away. Even though I didn't do anything wrong. And so I say all this because that's where telemarketing is. This is the kind of risk that you run. 
because the rules, people have gotten so fed up and frustrated with telemarketing in general. You literally have professional litigants. And what that means is you have people who are sitting around with cell phones, with numbers not on the do not call. And we trust our vendors to follow the law. We, we, there's only so much we can do, right? We can't like go into their system and make sure they're scrubbing everything. But we're at their mercy. And now we're in a position where people are actively going after agents because they're directly connected to these big money insurance companies and filing lawsuits. To me, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, ladies and gentlemen, just on that relation. And on top of that, even if this wasn't a problem, even if the liability issue wasn't a thing, the leads suck too, dude. They suck. They're so bad. They're not like they used to be whatsoever. It used to be, and of course, I'm sure somebody would tell me I'm wrong and that's cool, that's fine. There's always exceptions to rules, but they're just not like what they used to be. You pro if you guys have seen some of my old videos on avatar leads, those were good. It was good when you used to have, you know, like press one leads way back in the day. But nowadays, telemarketing is just dead. If you're going to, if you want a cheap lead, get a Facebook lead. Those are pretty good quality. I think they're, I think they're a lot better quality. And you've got the ability for them to opt in and request the information. You've got that stuff on your side. Whereas telemarketing, it's just it's just too hot to handle anymore. Uh oh, you lost the video and the audio. Uh oh. Okay. Yeah, I see what you guys are saying. Okay. I'm seeing some. Uh, looks like on my screen it's uh, refreshing, but it's not going through. I don't know why, but. Hopefully, we'll keep talking. Remember, guys, if you can hear me, you can always call into the conference call line and listen that way. Sorry for the uh, issues here, but everything seems to be okay on my end. So, okay. I'll just keep going. Uh, hey, Derek, good. Tell me how they go. All right. Uh, yeah, seeing a, the, what was the name of the book? It is, uh, Nothing is Impossible. And put Median, M-E-H-D-I, and that will bring you the book. Chris, hey, Chris, what's up, man? Chris says, not foolproof, but gives the best shot, I think. Not foolproof, but I think is, I'm working towards it after a month or two of FEX seminars, so 40 mail, mail in leads per week with appointment setter, stacking your days. Is that the best way? Absolutely. I, I believe the best thing you can do is, is buy as many leads as you can comfortably deal with and then outsource it to a competent and consistent telemarketer. I found out that the way I make the most money in this business is by seeing people and running appointments. If you're consistently running appointments and seeing people, then you're going to do okay. And I think you're going to get good results. But if you don't stay consistent seeing people, that's when you run into problems. So you got to have enough money and the more times you're at it, so you got to have enough leads to do that. And I think if you find a good appointment setter, you can start scaling your business in a way that you can if you don't. So take, for example, I've got one agent out of Cleveland. His name is Ryan. He's writing multiple months this year. He's written in excess of 40000 in premium. Uh, one month he did 50000 in premium. And this is all because, in part, he's a hard worker, but he also has a great appointment setter and buys a ton of leads. I have another agent named Nick. He's out of Kentucky. Same exact process. I trained a telemarketer, handed her over to him, and now he's staying super, super, super busy. And I think David out in Idaho is using the same telemarketer too, and it's great. So once you find a good one, man, it's a joy. And as long as you feed the person leads and you're dedicated to running as many appointments as possible, it's a game changer. So yeah, I like that setup, Chris. I hope you guys can hear and see me okay. Sorry if there's any problems. I have no clue what's going on. <clears throat> okay, Jim says, do you have a specific target criteria when choosing uh, zip codes for direct mail? Okay, good question. So... The long and short of it is that I want to work poor people, okay? I want to work in poor neighborhoods or I want to be wherever poor people are, okay? So that's just final expense. So find out where the poor neighbors are. They're going to be in the city. They're going to be in the country. They're not going to be in suburban America. Stay out of there. Uh, I wouldn't waste my time. People will reply back, but they won't have as much urgency. It's in the poor areas that you'll do better. So when you say, do you have specific target criteria when choosing zips? That's kind of roughly what I mean. Now, as far as income and all that, I would rather you trust your gut. If you know the area well, go where the blue collar, 
the lower income areas are and the rural areas are, that's a pretty good recommendation. You'll do just fine. 5280 Insurance Broker says, what is your thoughts when it comes to telesales do you recommend to align with? Yeah, great question. Uh, telesales is more popular now than ever, ever, especially for final expense. It's a niche that's worked well in term for a long time. Um, for me personally, I don't recruit agents to sell over the phone because I don't think it's a skill set that I personally have. I think one day, though, I'm going to hire or recruit an agent that has the ability to sell over the phone and then help recruit agents to him, kind of like a duplication of what I do, but in the telesales world, because I get so much interested people who want to do it. Right now, I'll tell you, my friends over at digitalbga.com are definitely worth looking at. I think they've got the best platform set up for the independent agent that wants to maximize commission and has the ability to buy leads. Uh, they do a great job. Check them out, digitalbga.com. I don't get any money by referring them. Um, uh, they're good people. They just do a really good job. If you absolutely are dead set on telesales, that's the way. If you want to sell face-to-face, -face, this guy is who you need to talk to. Okay. Uh, what is your thought? Oh, yeah. James says... What if you get the recording of the call and it's legit? Dude, it doesn't. Well, see, the, he, I, I totally understand where you're going from, but here's the thing. You're faced with an ongoing legal battle where you're going to fund a retainer for a lawyer for thousands and thousands of dollars. It's going to be emotionally a turmoil. It's going to be really problematic. And yeah, you may win, but at what cost to you? What's it going to actually solve? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know exactly like what goes along. I just know that I wanted this problem to go away because I thought it was, I obviously felt like you. It's like this woman had everything. And even if she didn't have the recorded call, the vendor was the one responsible for filling the order in the way they described. We're TPCA compliant. Well, if they're not, why don't you sue the vendor, not her? She's just the lead buyer. But according to what this professional litigant said he could sue anybody he wanted to that had a material opportunity to gain from the sale which was literally everybody in the food chain it was crazy so uh yeah i just prefer why not just avoid that altogether um it's just not worth it but not worth the risk i have something personally to lose now uh you know uh it, and and the truth is too there's better leads there's better leads hey ada what's up do you have any suggestions on when you meet with folks then they give you the think about it. How do you later follow up with them and try to get them to move forward? So um, the best thing to do with that is to ask them, when you say you need to think about it, how do you mean? Then just be quiet. Let them kind of go through the process. The reason we have objections is because we didn't do a good job of pre-qualifying earlier on. We didn't do a good job of fact-finding. We didn't do a good job of asking good questions to figure out the urgency, need, want, uh, and then the other factors. So you got to figure, first thing I would suggest is get better pre-qualifying and presenting and connecting with the client. And then use that little how do you mean technique to turn it around. Well, you know, maybe it's a price thing. Maybe it's because I'm just not sure if this is, maybe I need to talk to my daughter. And then you can go ahead and start to rebuttal it. Best thing I can do to go in a lot more detail is check out my videos. If you put in David Duford objection handling or objection rebuttal into YouTube, you'll see a ton of videos. Just start going through those. And you'll see a bunch of different examples of how to handle it. Um, the key thing to remember, though, is that this is your only opportunity to make the sale. This is a one-call close. Do not get in the habit of thinking that this is something you can go back and, and go see him again. It ain't going to happen. I had two people on my last ride-along date. The, the first dude, he was like, he, gave, he was hemming and hawing, and I said, I said, I basically tried every type of clothes, 30 day uh, free look. Why don't you start with the cheaper one if price is a deal? And he was giving me all this nonsense and he wouldn't commit. And he said, you know, I just need to, you know, do this and that. And I'll definitely call you Monday. I'm going to let you know Monday exactly that, that what I'm going to do. Either I'm going to let you know either way. And the other guy I saw it was a one legger. He said the same thing too. Did they call Monday? No. Do they ever call? No, they don't. So you have to, your goal, if you can, is to successfully conclude, conclude if this person is going to buy today or not. And not means never. You're never going back. So you have to exhaust all opportunity. But make sure you simultaneously get better 
at unearthing the opportunity, at fact-finding, at pre-qualifying. Again, go reference some of my videos, David Duford, uh, David Duford and YouTube, pre-qualifying, fact-finding, presenting. That will and, and compare how you're selling to how I teach it. You might find there's some opportunity to improve, and that may help with reducing that need to think about it objection. Hey, Kevin, can you do the same procedure for telesales? I'm assuming you're saying for selling over the phone. I covered that. So yes, if text texting, sure, you could do that as well. James says, do you buy, do you get your DM through paying per lead or buying per thousand? Yeah, uh, flat, straight up fixed pricing. I don't do per thousand anymore. It's too much of a risk. I've literally seen response rates in one county be 1%, and then the next door of the county was 2%. And that means my lead cost in one county was 25 and the other was 50. It's just all over the board. Why not remove that risk and let the mail house carry it? So you know exactly to the T what you're going to pay. Now, there may be some areas in the country that are higher response where I may not uh, consider that. I have an agent in South Dakota. He does a per thousand drop just because it's South Dakota. There's not a bunch of agents flailing all over the place like, say, in Tennessee or Georgia. So there are exceptions to the rules, but keep it simple on yourself and don't. Okay. Troy says, is it possible to still work a regular job and still work your insurance business until you have enough income? Great question, Troy, because I did it not just once, but twice. So the first time when I started selling insurance, I was in the, um, I was in the personal training business. Uh, I had been for years. It had deteriorated. I knew I needed to make a change, but I didn't want to give up the money. It was I was making enough money that it was worth my while to keep it going. So on the days I didn't personally train, I also went I went in the field and I sold. I did that for six months because I wanted to make sure before I quit my other business that I could have this full time final expense business to rely on. And so it so at that point I went full time in the final expense. Then as I referenced earlier, I failed out. Went and got a job working for Aramark Uniform Services, selling uniforms to businesses. Um, and after six weeks of that, I thought, my God, I can't do this. This is crazy. How can people do this? It's nuts. So after quitting the final expense business, saying I'm never going to get back into it, I decided I schemed a way to do this part time. And, and I did it for like two, I did it like three days a week. I'd work, I worked all day Saturdays that entire year. Uh, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd work and get home at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I went into the central time zone so I could squeeze out an extra hour of presentation and then get home real late. I was really motivated at that point. So, you know, I was running maybe 10, 12 appointments a week. It can be done. You just got to find the time to do it. You have to treat this as a profession. Don't dabble around, do an appointment here, appointment there. Keep goals, whatever time you have, make it your goal to hit that amount of appointments every single week. And then, each week from the proceeds of your sales, please save every penny because you need to save that money up to create a bankroll so you have money to live on since you're going to go into a straight commission sales eventually full-time and then money to probably, assumingly, buy leads. And the more the merrier. And if it takes you a year to do it, do take your time. This business is going to be there, but you may not be if you jump too fast into this and you're not financially prepared. That's my two cents. Hey, tax pro, how frequent do you recommend remailing the same zip codes? 60 to 90 days. No big deal. Hey, Derek, he asked, what company would insure someone with a pacemaker? Uh, Transamerica Standard. Um, I believe Liberty Bankers Life will without a defibrillator. Um, guys, if you want to queue in and help me out, Security National Life after two years, Family Benefit after two years. <clears throat> it just depends on when the pacemaker was installed. Um, it's fairly easy to do. There's lots of options. The certifier says, I will be homebound about a year and just started. Best markets and methods. Uh, thanks. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking to me. Thank you, Thomas. That's right. Um, uh, call digitalbga.com. Those are the guys to talk to about selling over the phone. Uh, I know guys that are selling final expense, but also regular term insurance. That's a product that's been sold over the phone uh, digitally for a lot longer than final expense. It works very well. Um, pick your poison, figure out the pros and the cons, and then go all in. They've got a whole system set up and technology to support you, as well as lead programs. Uh, Derek says, do you need to contact, text, email, Facebook leads the same day? No, you don't need to. It's good, though, if you do. Um, I worked leads last Friday that were generated in May and June. 
So you can work leads. They, they do have a little of a shelf life, although there's a ton of agents doing Facebook. So it's likely they'll respond to a lead just like in a direct mail circumstance. If you sit on a lead for long enough, the real buyers will send leads off and somebody else will show up. So I try to get to them as fast as possible. I think most people will agree the faster you get in contact with a digital lead, the better. Michael says, what is the best without a bank account? What is the best? Help clarify that sentence, Michael. Tax Pro says, did you recently mention a new GI product that actually pays partial stealth benefit beginning in the cert? Uh, yeah, do the same thing there. Clarify that for me. Uh, let's see how we got going here on the chat. So, okay. Very good. So we're at an hour mark now. Wow, that's incredible. Okay. So last call for questions. I'll let you guys line up the questions here as we kind of round things down. Sorry for anybody that got uh, kicked off. I don't know what happened with the live stream. Uh, I think you guys can hear and see me okay now. So, okay. Partial death benefit. Okay, did you mention a new guaranteed issue product that actually pays a partial death benefit being a certain third? Oh, okay. There's lots of those. I mean, you've got, oh, guaranteed issue. Hmm. I don't know of any. That would be interesting. I know there's graded plans like Aetna's or Forester's or Prosperity's, but I don't know of a true GI that does that. There used to be a product that was like a three question near GI that would have a graded be benefit. They actually would pay, they would do that for, I think, HIV clients, but they pulled the product recently. Uh, okay, Jim says, do you have a resource for matching specific health conditions to the appropriate carrier? There is a product that I interviewed the designer for. It's called Best Plan Pro. If you go into YouTube and put David Duford Best Plan Pro, you will see a video interview, and you can see how the product works. The guy does it on screen. You get the whole deal. I think it's like 50 or $60 a month if you follow my link, and it's actually really good. Uh, it shows the prescriptions. It shows the health history, and the output you get is the is about 90% accurate about what you can expect, the price, the coverage options, and the carrier. I've heard a lot of good things about it. There was one I did a long time ago. It's not that one, if you guys ever use it. That one was, was unfortunately, the guy didn't, didn't ever support it, and it never got off the ground, and it only did health history, but not prescriptions. But this new one does the whole thing. So you may want to look at that. It's called Best Plan Pro. Michael asks, if the customer does not have a bank account and needs to pay, who would take the account? Okay, get paid on the card. So if Christopher Smith is still here, I'd like to see his opinion on this. What happens when you run across a net spend card or a Walmart card or uh, any kind of reloadable debit card? And I'll just answer for Chris because I'm sure I, the reason I ask him because he probably we all run into this if you have any time in the field. The bottom line is those cards you really need to not <laughs> write if you can help it they're the worst percent they're way worse than direct express and part of the reason is you can't set up social security drafting they're just really poor i would almost say don't write them michael um however if you must write it uh yes thomas says beware you know what i'm talking about man um if you must write it security national family benefit I'll probably get terminated for mentioning that. <laughs> I hate that business. Uh, prosperity life. Um, anybody that takes credit card, probably prosperity life is what I would, I would, what I would do. I used to do this. I used to have a designated carrier back when I used to take direct bill on a monthly basis. I would send all that carrier that business. So I wouldn't screw up the persistency with my other carriers. So like, that's what I would kind of recommend. Um, take a carrier that you don't really care too much about and send that business there. Um, you're going to be paid as earned with most carriers, as you should be, because it's going to lapse, most likely. But those are a couple of carriers that would take them. But don't send that kind of business to the carriers you have a relationship and want to have. Oh, hey, hey, Cena, sorry about that. <clears throat> you have a lot of video in your YouTube channel. I wanted to watch them like a course for learning from beginning, but I don't know what... Video I should start from the, yeah, that's kind of the problem with YouTube is that I've done like, I looked at my video count, I've got like a thousand videos plus, and it's just incredible, the amount of talking that I do on video, it's amazing. It's hard to say where the talk, um, 
you know, I've got different categories of video. I've got interview based videos. Those are really good. I would recommend looking at those. So like put like David Duford interview into YouTube and you'll get a slew of different interviews I've done with top producers, agency managers. Those are a really good place to start. Um, David Duford live videos like this. You can watch all the ones I've done over the past year. Those are really good too. Um, the same kind of format, Q and a type of format. Um, and it just depends on what you're selling. Um, I think that would be a good place to start. And then from there, you, YouTube will suggest different videos that, that kind of are related to that kind of video. And I think that would be a good place to start because you're going to get a lot of good perspective from top producers. And you'll get different perspective, different opinions, but they'll be equally valuable. And uh, I think that will help you, again, envisioning what it is that you want to accomplish as, a, as an insurance agent and seeing what other people do successful. One great thing that I've been able to do interviewing top producers as I have the inside scoop, as well as all of you do if you listen to all this, you can hear and listen. If you listen very closely, you can hear what makes these people successful. You can hear their mindset, their energy, the determination. Many of these people struggled at one point in their career, almost quit. Some quit like me, came back. But you find there's a common thread of a of 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 success and and it's hard to describe what it is you really have to just watch the videos but it's been as much of an education for me to do the interviews as much as it is i'm sure for a lot of you guys so i would start there that would probably be best okay tax says will wearing a branded polo shirt be received well absolutely uh i used to go out in shorts and a polo uh, I know a guy that used to go out in a Spurs jersey and gym shorts. He lives in San Antonio. <laughs> that guy wrote a half million in a year. His name is Matt Mangia. Uh, he's legit. So uh, I, the, the dress issue, I mean, in all seriousness, I, I'm wearing khakis and a polo, like something like this, or jeans even would be just fine. If it's really hot where you're going or you live, shorts are fine. Trust me, it's not going to be scoffed at. Uh, Vin D, what's up, Vin Diesel? Ebby underwriting also does matching conditions with carriers. Any underwriting? Uh, clarify that for me. I'm a little confused. Uh, 5280. If someone is new to final expense and not financially stable, <clears throat> would you recommend going with a company like Lincoln Heritage and Senior Life? Yeah, I would. The thing that Lincoln Heritage and Senior Life will provide is lead financing. I don't do it anymore. I've been burned too many times. Um, and, and they've got a whole platform designed to help an agent who just doesn't have money lying around. Uh, they're good for a certain kind of agent. They're not good for like a person like me. Like when I started in this business, I didn't have any money. Uh, I had credit cards and I just loaded them up because I just believed in myself and I said, to hell with it. Damn the torpedoes. If I'm going to give myself a shot, I'm going to do it. And if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail right. And if I got to deal with debt, I'll deal with it. But I was at that point in my life where, you know, I just, that was my mindset, I guess. So, but if you're not like that, then it's fine. Lincoln Heritage provides in senior life, all these have lead financing platforms, uh, regular types of training, you got to believe in the product, though. That's the big thing. I wouldn't do this if you don't believe in the Funeral Consumer Guardian Society or the funeral program that Senior Life provides. Um, and you got to believe in selling one product. And you're going to be in situations listening to this, even just this one video, if this is all you listen to, you know you're going to be in positions where Lincoln's not the best option. And you got to be all right with that. And some people, they're okay with it. For me, I would never be. Not because of an ethical issue. It's just... I want the freedom to choose for my clients what's best so that I don't have to worry about some schmuck like me coming behind them and replacing a Lincoln Heritage. You know what I mean? Like that. And that's something you have to worry about too. So, um, so yeah, give it some thought. You know, hey, look, you could always start part-time, get a part-time job, save some money up for a year. Again, I know it sounds crazy. It's like, but I don't want to wait. But this business is going to be around, and, and all you really need is $5,000, give or take. You can, do a little, you can do it with less on a part-time basis if you're going to start off. But you just need a couple of thousand kind of like seed capital. And you can do that bartending on the weekend, uh, garage sailing and selling on eBay, uh, Gary 
Uh, v talks about that a lot. I think that's great. <clears throat> or just regular old part-time jobs. Just save up the money and uh, give yourself the ability to do this the right way. And so that may be something to seriously consider too, especially if you have biases like what I'm talking about, like being independent, having multiple carriers. Um, you're, gonna, you're going to struggle selling something if you don't believe in it. That's what I found out with Aramark. I did not like the products. I didn't like their service. I didn't like their contracts. There was better service providers and I knew it, but I had to sell Aramark because that's how I made a living. And, and it's, it's like you're a slave. It's like you're told to work and do something because that's how you put money on the table. And I'm just not good at, at swallowing that. So, you know, to each their own, I guess. Tax Pro, last question. Yeah, and, and in case there's no more questions, this will be the last one of the night. Do you have more room on your FE team for a newbie under you? Oh, man, this is perfect. This is like a checks in the mail kind of stuff. So how do you find out more about working with me, El Jefe? Well, it's real simple. Uh, <laughs> go to daviddufour.com. Yes, I'm recruiting. I recruit nationally. I have agents fly in, drive in, do a day-long ride with me. Uh, just to see how this business is, to learn it and kind of get started. I just had an agent come in from, uh, actually, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, I've had agents come in from all over the place. So absolutely welcome to. I'm always recruiting agents, always looking for people who uh, feel like they are a good fit for what I do and believe in themselves, can invest in themselves. So if you want to find out more, go to daviddufour.com, click the Join Dave's Insurance Agency, watch the series of videos at your own pace, no pressure on my end. And then if everything sounds good to you, you can click the set an appointment uh, link to talk to me later. Okay. Checks in the mail, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> okay. James, I sold junk FE with AIL and I was only able to do it because social media didn't exist. Yeah. They were able to keep me drinking Kool-Aid because I didn't know better. Yeah. And that's what, I'm not saying they do it or not, but like that's look Kool-Aid dispensary is a part of the, uh, captive operation for a reason. They don't want you knowing what your competition does. That's why you see a lot of captive agents six to 12 months in, they start getting replaced and they're like, why am I getting replaced? Isn't this the best product ever? Isn't this the biggest company in the world? Haven't we grown more than anybody? Blah, 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 all the crap they've been fed. And then they realize, oh, wow, there's a whole different world out there. But the problem with the captive environment is that many of them, not all, but many of them, don't fully vest you to where you own your book of business, which means if you leave after a year of discovering that there's the grass is greener on the other side, you lose all that renewal money. You lose all that commission you haven't been paid. So they've got the handcuffs in. They've got the, uh, the nails in deep. It's hard to get out until the two-year mark is up. All of this do is done intentionally, understanding the natural progression that agents go through once they discover what the final expense business is really about. So James is absolutely right. I don't know how people overprice, sell overpriced policies uh, in a world of readily available information because most, because a lot of people are lazy. Most people know nothing about life insurance, and the first person to explain it to them that seems presentable does a good job. That's why I say so much. Much of the sale really just depends on you, not the company. That's true. That's why you see these companies do so well. But it leaves a, of opportunities to those out there with the better options. Yeah, and and on that note too, I think every day that all of those companies you mentioned are they are in existence because they are they're first of all they're helping people that didn't have coverage before second of all when i run into them guess what i got the better deal i don't have to convince them to buy insurance they already buy it they already believe in it i'm going to show them a better deal i'm going to get them more coverage i'm going to get them less expensive coverage i'm going to give them a better deal and i'm going to create a, a happy client that way and in some ways i think that's a bit easier than starting with somebody who hasn't spent a dime on life insurance and doesn't know if it's right for them or not. So thank you for all those captive companies. You uh, helped me earn a good living. Okay, last question here. Vin Diesel says, no, I don't work for them, but I do use them. Underwriting rules can be queried to determine the end. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, don't know what that is. But anyways, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that was meant for us. So we'll leave it at that, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining my live stream today. Uh, if you like this video, please share it with other insurance agents. This is a great resource for a lot of new, exper inexperienced agents who want some perspective on this business or even experienced agents maybe that are struggling. Please share this video. 
like it. If you haven't commented yet, feel free to comment, especially if this is a recording. If you have a question you want me to address or anything you'd like me to clarify, you are welcome to. Thank you so much, Tax. I'm glad you think this is a killer live stream. I do enjoy doing these. And uh, thanks for the guys on the conference call. I hope you enjoyed listening. And uh, as always, I'm here to help you. You're welcome to stop in any time to any of my videos. Leave a comment. I reply to all of them personally. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, how I help insurance agents become top producers, go to daviddufour.com. Check out the website. Click Join David's Agency for more. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next time.